If you can believe the first verse, then the rest is much easier. The silence that you hear is a result of people not knowing what the first verse is. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And if you can believe that, then the rest gets easier. And so if God created the heavens and the earth, then he has the right to establish what a family should be. And a person that simply takes what the Lord says is the standard for a family is simply a believer of, uh, tra of the traditional biblical views. And so God did an amazing thing in creation. He used his six days so well that he not only created day and night, sea and dry land, the earth and the sky, uh, all birds, all fish, and all land creatures. He also created man in his own image and woman from the flesh and bone of man. But he not only created all those things, he created the human family. That was God's creation. He made it so he can establish it the way that he chooses. I'd like to read to you a passage of Scripture today, not the very first verse, but the second chapter of the first book of the Bible, chapter number two of Genesis. And it's a fairly significant passage here, a few verses involved, but let's, let's read together, beginning with verse 18, chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to to him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field, but for Adam there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from him, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, Now this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And this is the explanation of where families began. One man, one woman. What if the man didn't like the woman? Tough. He had no options. What if the woman didn't care for the man? And so, <laughs> well, we can discuss these things in another night. But what I'm telling you is the plan of God was for a family to begin with one man and one woman. God made it that way. Anybody's deviation from that concept is not a biblical view of a marriage or of a family. So, what we're going to try to do today, I, I realized that we made a little um, mistake when we planned this sermon series on the fight, and we gave one, um, one installment to cover family. It, that should have been enough to cover several Sundays, but we only have one. So, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the uh, ten most significant um, at attributes of a biblical family and uh, the biblical examples of these. So the very first one, uh, value of a biblical family was adoption. And so uh, in the case of adoption, we have the holy family to, to represent to us an adoption. 
This was when Joseph never had, he was a man who never had one word that he spoke recorded in the scripture. Yet, he became the most influential earth father in the Bible because he adopted his wife's son. I want that to just kind of sit on here a little bit there. I want you to think about what I just said. And this is a world, this is a biblical worldview of a family. When Joseph adopted his wife's son. The second uh, value that we want to look at is forgiveness. Now, uh, we, we talked not long ago about uh, another Joseph. The New Testament Joseph was the, the uh, ad adopted father, adoptive father of Jesus. The Old Testament Joseph was the son of Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And uh, his uh, 11th son was his favorite, a man named Joseph. Little, little son grew up, and he's spouting out these dreams that God was giving him. And uh, you'd think, well, the little prophet would get a lot of favor with his brothers, but that was exactly not the case. His first dream was that he and his brothers were all gathering wheat up in the field, and they bound their wheat into um, sheaves. And after he, they were bound and stood up in the field, the, the, his brothers, his 11 brothers' sheaves bowed down to his sheep. Boy, did his brothers love to hear about that. I mean, that, that made them so happy. And, uh, and his second dream that he told about even offended his father. He was his favorite, father's favorite son, but... His second dream was he dreamed that the sun and the moon and 11 stars all bowed down to him. And when Joseph gave that story to his family about that great dream, I mean, not only was his brothers upset, but his father even was offended by that dream. And his brothers continued to have this jealousy grow up inside their hearts against their brother Joseph. Their, their father had made him a coat of many colors. And we understand that that was significant, that a father would give to the son that had the birthright such a coat as that, a coat with many colors. And when the brothers saw Joseph walking in the field with those many, that coat of many colors, their response was, huh, here comes the dreamer. Here comes the brother that says we're all going to bow down to him. And they became so deeply embittered against their brother and his dreams that when a band of um, Ishmaelites passed through the land, they sold their own brother to the Ishmaelites as a slave. And he was taken out of his homeland down into the land of Egypt where he served as a slave. And after being accused falsely of a sexual attack, assault against his master's wife, he was cast into prison. He had done nothing wrong, but he was estranged from his family, taken away from his homeland, cast into prison, and spent years in the prison in Egypt. And... Um, the, it, the, the day came, what's the expression? The worm turned. This man that had been sold as a slave and had been falsely accused and cast into prison gained the favor of Pharaoh. He was brought out of prison. There was a chain put around his neck and a ring on his finger, and he was named the second ruler of the entire land. Of Egypt. And the day came when a drought settled in on the land. It was so severe that all of Egypt was plagued, but not only that, the drought went into the land of Canaan as well. And so his father Jacob and his 11 brothers were all faced with starvation because 
of the drought. And so they heard that there was food in Egypt. They didn't realize that it was their own brother that they had sold into slavery that was in charge of meeting out uh, that food that had been stored up over the previous seven years. They didn't know it was their brother that had supernatural warning from God that this famine was coming. And so out of desperation, they traveled into Egypt, and Joseph had his brothers right where any vindictive person would have wanted them to be. They were totally at his mercy. But when he could have squashed them like so many cockroaches, he sustained their life and brought them into the land of Goshen the finest segment of all of Egypt, these brothers that had treated him so cruelly, he forgave them. Forgiveness is such a major role in what a biblical family is all about. Also, the value of peace. I like peace in the family, don't you? I like peace in the family so well that sometimes... Whenever there was chaos, I would just rectify the problem by shipping the kids all off to the grandparents. <laughs> I'm playing with you now. Peace was an is an attribute of a biblical family. Jacob and Esau had, a, um, had an enmity between them. And the enmity was that Jacob had used a a cunning ploy to take away from his brother Esau the earthly blessing of the firstborn. He took the birthright. He did it by deception. And this became so severe that the last message that he heard from his brother for over 20 years was, as soon as our father has died, I don't want to grieve our father, but as soon as our father has died, I'm going to kill my brother because of what he did to me. And um, Jacob fled from the face of his brother, was gone 20 years. During that time he married and he had these 12 sons. And when they met again, it was after this 20 years that bitterness had a way of, uh, have, had festered between them. When it came time for Jacob to return home, the scripture relates the story of Jacob wrestling with the Lord. His nature to be a deceiver, his nature to be a cheat, all came to the forefront until God reached his hand and touched Esau to the point that he never walked the same way again. This rest of his life, he could be designated from a great distance away when someone would just see him walking because he had a distinct limp as a result of the mighty way that God had touched his life. But he not only touched his, his skeletal construction, he touched Jacob's life and made Jacob a new man. Now, I hate to say this, but I'm going to say it. Jacob, uh, by the way, that's a, a Hebrew term. English like to change to James. But Jacob is, uh, it, it, the name means deceiver. I, I apologize to all the Jacobs in the room today. I, I shouldn't probably throw that up in your face. Jacob is a, is a name that is used, and great men have carried that name. People probably didn't realize because it had the, it had the connotation as a biblical name. But the name meant deceiver. And when God touched Jacob, he said, from this day on, they're not going to call you deceiver. And he changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And he said, from this day forward, you're going to be known as being a prince with God. His life was changed. He met with his brother. And he was reconciled to his brother. Peace between Jacob and Esau. Now, in the Middle East today, we're still seeking that 
the children would all learn what Esau and Jacob found years ago. That is peace between their descendants. But peace is a very special value in a biblical home. Number four is the attribute of mercy. That is a, that is a value of the Christian home. And um, so I want to just give you one, uh, the, the example that we, that we are pointing to, the biblical example was the prodigal son. Here this young man so despised his father that he, that he basically said, when he went to him and said, Father, I want you to divide our inheritance right now. I want you to take the things that should fall to me and give them to me now. What he's really saying is, all the wealth that you have, have accumulated for our family, that's more important to me than your life is. I just assume you'd die and that my brother and I would receive the inheritance today. And... Um, but despite that, his father divided the inheritance and gave it to him and his father. And the uh, prodigal went to a far country and wasted everything that his father had given him. You know about that. The, the son realized what terrible thing. When he came to himself, he realized, you know, I, I'm living in an awful place. But even the servants that work for my father have a life better than I do. And I don't deserve his forgiveness. I don't deserve to be called a son anymore. But if I went back there, if he would just hire me, my life would be so much better than living out here in this pig pen wanting to eat pig food. And so he made his trip back with this prayer that he was, re was rehearsing all the way back. He was going to tell his father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he, he rehearsed this over and over again as he made his way back but when his father saw him, he began to recite the words. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. But before he could continue the words that he had rehearsed, his father stopped him and said, bring the robe and put it on his shoulders and put shoes on his feet and bring the signet ring. Now that's so significant because the signet ring meant He's in the family. That was what the family wore. He said, bring, okay, 2024. 20, that's like, bring the debit card. Mercy. Mercy. You know what? We all love mercy when it's applying to us. But the one that has offended us, it's more difficult. But the attribute of a biblical family is the attribute of mercy. So let me tell you this. One of these days, everybody in the entire universe is going to stand before God, and every one of them are going to need mercy. There's no exception to it. There's not one person that can say, I deserve to enter into eternal life on my own merit. No. No, you can get into eternal life, but not on your merit. On Jesus' mercy. His mercy. And so here's what Jesus said. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And I make you a promise today, one of these days you're going to wish that you had been merciful. Because you're going to need mercy. And this is such a powerful part of a Christian family, of a biblical family is the attribute of mercy. The quality of hospitality. The widow and her son were at the end of their means. This, this was a woman that lived in Old Testament times and had no means of support, and a drought had fallen on the land. She had no income. She had no hope. All she had left was a barrel that had once been full of meal, but now it has one handful of meal left in the bottom of that barrel. And she's got a cruise. I don't even know what a cruise looks like, but a cruise is a bottle of some type. It's, uh, it's probably made out of clay. It's probably some type of pottery. But it would hold oil. 
And with that handful of meal, grain, and the little oil that was left in that cruise, this widow woman projected that she would have enough to make one cake left, barley cake, and that her and her son, she'd make that cake, and they would divide that one cake, and that was all that they had, and then they'd die. Now, that was, that was her forecast for the future. But the Lord sent her a preacher. Now, there's people in the world today that would say the last thing that that woman needed was a preacher. But that wasn't the truth. That was the next thing that that woman needed was a preacher. And the other thing, Don, I'm ahead of you on this. I hadn't heard this yet. The other thing that woman needed was an offering. She needed, she needed someone to pass the plate. You said, well, she didn't have anything to give. That was exactly why she needed the offering. So God sent the preacher to the woman and said, I need a drink of water. And she had hospitality. So she rushed to get him a drink of water. But as she was on her way, he stopped and said, and by the way, could you just bring me a cake? I need something to eat. And that's when she told him her story. I've got one handful of meal, and I've got one cruise of just a little oil, enough to make one last cake. I'm out here now collecting a few sticks to build a fire so that I can make my last cake. And I'm going to share it with my son, and then we're going to die. Now, I can hear what some of you people are thinking. You're thinking that preacher should have apologized. But he didn't apologize. What he said was, well, do just what you said, but first bring me a cake. Shh, that noise you hear, that's the sound of fat in the fire. People sizzling right now thinking, oh, did he really say that preacher should have taken her last cake? No, he needed to take her next cake. Because what she did was she baked that cake and gave it to the prophet. And he ate that cake, and then she returned to that uh, meal, that grain, and the cruise of oil, and there was enough to make another cake. And so she made another cake, and her and her son ate that cake. Now, I'm going to tell you what happened was that barrel of meal never ran out, and that cruise of oil never went empty, Throughout the rest of that entire famine, the prophet and the widow and her son ate for three and a half years from that one cruise of oil, that one barrel of meal. You thought that woman needed an offering given to her. No, what she needed was a chance to be obedient to God and her hospitality saved her and her son in the time of famine. Now, I, I'm going to be honest with you about number six. Um, can I be honest? How many say, not one minute. Of course I'm going to be honest. I'm, I want to be circumspect. I want to be uh, forthright. I want to I tell you more than I have to tell you. Okay. I'm going to talk to you about prayer. Prayer being part of the characteristics of a biblical family. And so I was looking for a good example of that, and I found Simeon and Anna. How many recognizes those names? Do you know who I'm talking about? So i got to tell you the truth. i got, I got to tell you, you know, you, you, you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth. I'm going to tell you the whole truth. I don't really think Simeon and Anna were married. They just happened to be at the same place at the same time. And they were old people. But, but what they had in common was they were both looking for the birth of the Messiah. 
both of them were persuaded they were going to see the birth of the Messiah, and I don't really think that they were married. But for the sake of our little message here today, we're going to say they were, uh, they were representative of grandparents and families. Would you say that? They're not married, but they do each represent what it's like to have a godly grandparent or, or a grandmother or grandfather, a patriarch, a matriarch of a family that prayed. And here was the result of that was Simeon had this knowledge that he would see the Messiah before he died. And that was because of his life of prayer and consecration and a promise that was made to him. And then we're going to talk about Anna. Now, they may have been strangers. They happen to be at the same place. They may have been strangers. They, probably, they possibly were not husband and wife. Most likely they weren't. I'm just looking for a good example of the elderly prayer uh, matriarch or patriarch to a family. And uh, I, I just want to tell you that a family needs to be based on prayer. It's a, I know it's not a scripture, it's only an adage, but the, the adage that the family that prays together, stays together, has some merit. The, the fact is, studies have been done. Studies. I, I just saw people's eyes glaze over when I said that. Studies have been done. But the fact is that when people go to church together, families go to church together, they, that does not have a significant improvement to how many of those marriages survive. There are just as many divorces among people that attend church as there are among people that don't attend church. The number's the exact same. But now, those of you that have taken our premarital counseling that we offer to couples being wed in this church know that there is a number. The number is 1 in 1,014. That is a huge uh, in, uh, difference of ratio. So people that get married but don't pray together they have a failure one out of two, 50%. 50% is the success rate of a marriage if people do not pray together. But if people do pray together, husband and wife, I don't care if they go to church or not, if they pray together, there is only one failure out of 1,014 marriages, and that is a statistical fact. Are you praying? Because if you want your marriage to be successful, the one thing that almost guarantees success is if husband and wife will pray together. Maybe I should quit preaching now. I think I feel conviction settling upon the congregation. Let's move on. Number seven. The sense of belonging. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. I'm going to turn there in my Bible. We're going to read it together. Ephesians chapter number 2. And I'm going to start reading with verse 19. Ephesians 2, 19. It says, Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Folks, there is a longing in everyone's heart. There may be a very, very, very few 
exceptions. But the need to be part of something, the, the need to have a sense of belonging is in virtually everybody's soul. A place to belong, people to be with, a role that you play, a part that you fulfill. And um, this describes perfectly the family of God. Jesus was, uh, did you all know that Jesus' family did not really believe in him? Later they did, but they didn't. Now, what I'm talking about is two of his half-brothers, Joseph and Mary, had at least six children, maybe seven or more, besides Jesus. And two of those brothers did not believe in him at all until the resurrection, but later became so persuaded of his being the Messiah that they actually wrote two of the books of the New Testament. But before his death and resurrection, they did not believe him. They thought he was, in fact, crazy, insane. He lost his mind. And so he was in one of those situations where thousands of people were thronging him, and he had been for days on end ministering to them. And his brother said, you know, we really got to, we really got to calm him down. He's, he's letting this go to his head. These crowds that are following, he, he's really getting the idea that he's the son of God. <laughs> they didn't believe him. And so they sent a message into him. We want to talk to him. We want to talk to Jesus. And so they got the message to him and said, Lord, your brothers want to see you. Your family wants to talk to you. And he said, my family. He said, this is my family. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Matthew chapter 12, verse 50. If you do the will of God, you're part of the family. You know, some people feel alone and and lack of family is a a heartbreak to, to many people. But I want to tell you, there's an open end invitation Jesus says, you can be in my family. You can be my brother. You can be my sister. You can be in my family. He that does the will of my father is my brother, my sister, and my mother. Amen. Number eight, family values in the Bible. Celebration. Um, Anywhere, anything, uh, in any place, I should say, in all of... of, uh, Palestine. Uh, Jesus could have chosen anywhere in Judah, anywhere in Gilead. He could have chosen anywhere in in, uh, um, the area around Nazareth. Throughout the land, he could have chosen any place to open his ministry of miracles. Galilee was his home area. Nazareth was his home village. What a place it would have been to launch his ministry of miracles uh, in his hometown. But he didn't. He didn't choose any of those places. Uh, Well, in fact, I think maybe Mary had a lot to do with the choice. Uh, Jesus and his disciples had been invited, as had his mother, to attend a marriage a wedding in the little village of Cana. I, I've been to Cana. It's an interesting little trip. And um, I was on a, uh, a tour of the Holy Land with a few other preachers. It was, kind of, it was called a promotional tour. They're hoping we'd all come back home and line up a bunch of people from our church to go, you know, for a Holy Land tour. Well... These other fellas were from what we like to call nominal churches. And uh, so I'm, with, I'm, on this, I'm on this bus and um, just a couple of uh, my Assemblies of God brethren, the others were of various faiths. We are teetotalers. 
We drink Welch's orange, uh, Welch's grape juice when we take communion. They didn't. And this is a strange thing. So we're visiting Cana of Galilee. There are virtually no Pentecostals in Cana of Galilee. Ain't nobody laughing but me. You don't get to where I'm going, do you? I don't know why they do it because who cares if you've got a bottle of wine that comes from Cana of Galilee? Jesus didn't make that wine wine. The people in Cana made that wine. Do you all understand where I'm coming from? I'm telling you they sell wine in Cana of Galilee. All these silly Christian people they like to say, I got this wine from Cana of Galilee. That's where Jesus turned the water and wine. That wine's been gone a long time ago. And, um, <laughs> okay, well, so I, could, I, I, I tried to reason with some of them Methodists and Episcopals, why are we drinking wine, or why are you getting wine from? Anyway, I couldn't make, I couldn't make any points with them. Um, but it was a, it was a wedding where Jesus performed his first miracle. They ran out of wine. <laughs> and Jesus uh, performed his first miracle there. His, his mother kind of set this up, you know. He, uh, she says, uh, Jesus, they've run out of wine. And he says, what does that got to do with me? My time has not yet come. And as if he hadn't said one thing to her, Mary turned right around to the servants and said, Whatever he tells you to do, you do it. <laughs> well, thanks, Mom. Put me on the spot. <laughs> Whatever he tells you to do, do it. So Jesus said, take those water pots and fill them full of water. And so five or six water pots, 30 gallons apiece filled with water. And he didn't say another word. He didn't. He just told them, fill them with water. And when they did... The servants took out of that water pot to the master of the feast who tasted it, and it was wine. It, it was a, it, you, this is something that we do in our families. This is, a, this is a biblical attribute of a, of a, of a biblical family. We celebrate. We, uh, I, I, some of you all folks that ran off and eloped when you got married, Give your family a chance to celebrate with you. Somebody said, oh, when, they, when I die, they can just cremate me and just put me out in the... Well, if, if you want to be cremated, okay, but give your family, give your church family a chance to mourn, a chance to grieve, a chance to reflect on your life, a chance to celebrate your victory. Give, give them a chance. That's that when your kids graduate from high school, go to the graduation. Quit being a, a deadbeat. Go go celebrate with them. They've done something. It's it's significant. Let's let's rejoice with the people that rejoice in our family. Let's celebrate successes. Let's celebrate when God has done something great in the lives of of an individual. I just got two more. I bet you all thought I was going to go to 20. We just got two more. So, hope. Now, Mary and Martha sent letters to Jesus and said, if you don't get here in a hurry, we fear that Lazarus is not going to live. This was two sisters and their brother. And, and they called him the one that Jesus loved. They had a relationship. He knew them on a personal level. But Jesus waited two days, and then he made the trip to Bethany where Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived. When he got there, they said, well, he's been in the grave four days. Now, I want you to quickly do the math. I don't know if you thought about this before. Jesus just waited two days. If he had left immediately when he got word about Lazarus, if he had gone straight to the tomb, Lazarus would have still been in the tomb for two days. This was all on purpose. It was done for a plan. Mary and Martha were both confronting Jesus with the same accusation. Master, if you had have been here, 
he would not have died. And I know that you go through things because every one of us do go through things. When we know that, that God is able and we ask him and we don't get what we expected. And some people get bitter about that. I hear about people that become bitter about God not answering a prayer and someone has passed and, and, or, or some other thing has happened, opportunity to, for God to intervene. We say, well, God could have done something, and he didn't. Well, you know, God knows more than you know. God's got a plan that's bigger than your plan. And, you know, that's part of our relationship with God is loving him and trusting him enough to believe that he loves us and that he'll do the right thing for us. And so Mary and Martha teaches us hope. They waited and they hoped as long as Lazarus was alive. And they waited for Jesus to come. If he'll get here before Lazarus dies, Lazarus will be all right. But he died. The, the, the time of his suffering came to an end. And they prepared him for burial. Put him in the tomb. And they covered the tomb with a stone. And they began lamentation and wept for the loss of their brother. And when Jesus arrived, they brought accusation and said to him, if you'd come. And the Bible says this, Jesus wept. That is the shortest verse in the Bible, and it's also one of the most pungent verses in the Bible. Jesus came knowing what he was going to do. It was a plan. The father had talked to him about it. He knew that Lazarus had been in the grave when he came. He knew. But when Mary and Martha expressed their severe grief, it touched his heart, and Jesus wept. But then he raised him from the dead, and it shows us that there's never a a reason for a believer to give up hope. With Jesus, it is never too late. Amen. And number 10 is loyalty. And uh, I, I, I think that Ruth would have been it would have been proper, it would have been okay. I don't think it would have been a, I don't see how it would have been a sin if she had said to her mother-in-law, Ruth, you know, um, I, I've been married to your son. I'm from a different nationality. My family's here. You want to go back to Israel, and so I want to thank you for our past and all the things we've held in common and the thing, but I'm going to stay. I'm going to go back to my home of my mom and my daddy. I think if she had done that, I don't see how it could have been a wrong thing to do, except there had been a love, family love established between this, this Moabite woman named Ruth and her Israelite mother-in-law, name was Naomi. So here, when she should have said, she could have said goodbye, here's what she said. Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. And your people shall be my people. And your God, my God. And where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. And that is the attribute of the Christian. And that's worth fighting for. That's worth submitting your 
preference. It, it is worth yielding to the wishes of others to preserve. It's worth standing against all the devils of hell to defend. A wayward child, a wayward son or daughter, and the heartbreak that would make you say, well, if that's what they decided to do, then I have no power to intervene in that. We give up that right. We carry a prayer vigil from that day for the rest of our life until we see that son or that daughter reconciled to the family. It's, it's worth it. It's worth fighting for. I'd like to ask everybody please to stand with me. I want to tell you before we pray here in just a second, we're, we're having a water baptismal service at the end of the service today. But before we do that, before we, we uh, follow the Lord in water baptism, a little later on, I want us to pray. We're, we're fighting for our family. We got, we've got the world around us um, that's infringing on what a biblical family ought to be. And it's worth the fight. It's worth the fight to hold it and to cherish it and make it work. It's that precious. And it's that precious that the household of faith exudes these same values that we've, we've shared today. So I'm going to pray for everybody. But what I want to offer to do is if your family's here with you today, I might invite you to get with them and come and stand around the front here with me for this final prayer. So just to kind of make it... Make it a personable thing today. If you're, if you're here with your family, you can come and stand with them. You can pray at your seat if you'd like to. But I invite you to come and join me here in the front or all around the front of this altar area. We're going to pray for families today. We're going to pray that God will help us. We're fighting for our homes. We're fighting for these precious values today that we're talking about. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning to the end it will always be it's always, always been, been you, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, be the center of my life. Jesus, be the center of my life. From beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus. Amen. Just before we pray now, and as Linda continues to play, I want you to consider in your family, whatever that, however that uh, appears today, your, your literal kinship family or your adopted family or your church family, those people that are near to you that make up your a circle of influence and involvement. What do you need today? What needs to happen? What touches your heart? Is there one that is breaking off, being, becoming prodigal, moving away, uh, exercise, pulling away from the home? Is there somebody sick? Is there somebody in physical need? Or is there somebody that has a financial challenge today? I want you to think about your family. And we're going to ask God to get intervene, get involved, intervene with every one of these situations here today. Amen. Amen. You can call on Him. 
as you have need, and as your family has need, I'm going to pray for everybody's family here today. And we're going to believe God to do a life-changing thing. Praise the Lord. Let's call on Him right now. Father, the first thing before you made governments, before you established even churches or places of worship, the primary thing you made was a, was a home, was a family. So we know how important that is to you. And it's important to us. And we have our loved ones. We have our sons and our daughters, our mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters. We have extended family. Lord, they're, they're dear to us. And we believe they're a gift from God. We're praying in behalf of every one of those. Praying, Lord, that you'll make our homes close. Our relationships dear, that we'd hold, we uphold one another, that we would stand in support of one another. Lord, I'm asking right now for Jesus' sake that you would help us to grow together in bonds of love and endearment. Oh God, teach us to exude mercy and to exude forgiveness. Help us, Lord God, to, to be the model of a biblical family. And we pray on behalf of those family members right now that are wayward. We're asking that the Holy Ghost would go after them and that you'd arrest them and bring them home. Let them come to themselves and let them seek their way home. Help us, Lord, to find them and bring them home. Those that are sick in body, these are our family members. We're asking, Lord God, that the atonement, the, the, the stripes on the back of Jesus would avail to give healing, health, strength, life for Jesus' sake. We're praying that. We're praying, Lord, that you'd meet the needs of our families. Some of them that are broken, some of them are suffering grief and loss, let the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, do a work among them. We pray for it in Jesus' precious name. If you're with your family and you're standing with your family now, I want you to take them in your arms or hold their hands and let's pray one for another. Let's ask God's blessing on them. Let's ask God's favor on our homes and our families and our lives together. Would you do it? Let's pray one for another. We pray right now, Lord. Move, Lord.